let's let's give the the watchers some sense something as far as when you were on the blue side, right? Mm-hmm. And you were doing you said you're doing incident response, mm-hmm. but specifically app security, right? Yes. Can you in so many like a short form words, like kinda explain that and then sure. I guess what that consisted of and then I guess what would like be some skill sets people would need to know how to do that? For sure. So um hmm, I wanna keep it as simple as possible. Okay. Let's say that you have a product, you have a tech product, um, and it's made up of a host of different parts, right? You have components, um, you have programming languages, you have uh, libraries. And some of those libraries, let's refer to them as dependencies because they may not be the main part of your application, but they're really supporting um, your application. And they have made it easier for you to get this product to market um, as a developer because you don't have to say ABC, this class, that class, this class. You can import that library in and you can get that functionality, right? And um, just as an aside, it does make use of application programming interfaces. Um, so that is a, like one of the levels of API integrations in, in a development stack. So sometimes uh, people look at products as a whole. Um, however, security incidents and vulnerabilities can happen at the most granular levels, right, of a product, meaning some small dependency, some small component part that you're not even checking for in your product, it has some type of point of failure. What are we talking about? That could be as simple as the way that this functionality is written as a class, um, as far as uh, programming languages goes, that class may be implemented um, in a way that allows um, a user or somebody that is inputting information or data into the application to make it behave in a way that it's not intended to. Um, that does not necessarily mean that that's malicious intent, right? However, once it is discovered that if you put a space, and this is completely hypothetical, if you put a space after this class or if you change um, a configuration of a specific class to say on when it should say off, Um, you can then connect to it through some type of remote connection protocol or whatever, or it will lead to a pathway um, into the deepest (laughs) recesses of that application, remote code execution. That is some of the subject matter of some of the worst vulnerabilities that affect applications, specifically web applications made up of programming languages and dependency libraries, specifically open source libraries. What's an open source library? Java. That's in everything, right? And that's when we talk about Log4j, that is what we're talking about. We're talking about something that is so prevalent, that is so ubiquitous in these digital products that it is a five alarm fire when it is found out, especially when it's made public, key, when it's made public, Mm -hmm. right? Because at first it wasn't malicious, just the fact that it exists, right? But when we make it public, that opens up the door and it gives those who could be would be malicious the opportunity to use that right for malicious intent to then you know bypass some of our other security protocols using these essentially these back doors or these openings in the programming language right so as an application security engineer and an incident responder our jobs um with the with the use and it's and it's really complicated because we have appsec engineers but each of us are doing different stuff right we have um people that work in the SOC that are doing firewall we have intrusion detection we have um signature malware analysis we have um oh gosh we have so much stuff i wish i could just like give all of it away right now but um there's a lot of us so me i got to connect the dots between the person who recognized in Splunk or other technology that, hey, this looks off, this traffic um, looks a little bit different, or we have an advisory that there is a zero day in this program, Mm -hmm. then I go look at all of the products that a company has, and I say, which one has this component? Mm -hmm. And that's when it gets deep, because that's when it's like, how clean is your house? Because... How do we know what it's made of? Let's say it, what's it called? Red eight. What's the name of that food coloring? That's really bad. Red something, red nine, a food coloring. That's really bad. How do, is there a body right in our, in our dietary 
products or industry in our dietary industry in our food industry that says I have a repository and I have a list of every single product that we eat that has this red dye in it that we now know is poisonous to us we don't and most cyber security most tech companies don't have this to the degree that they need to I mean how many of us have it if they if we were like oh there's xyz in this in this type of uh dye how mm-hmm. could how could we just you know, get that information. So nine times out of 10, that becomes a really complicated thing. And so as an AppSec incident responder, it was my job to bridge the gap between understanding the the elements, okay? The elements of a vulnerability, okay, you need A, you need B, and you need C. And then I would go into the products and say, do you have A? <laughs> do you have B? Do you have C? And it's not enough for them to say, no, <laughs> I don't know. Yes, like we have to have... Um, technological ways of, uh, of validating um, a tech stack. And, and when it comes to the programming language, that can be pretty simple because that's a static code analysis, right? So um, let's say in, a, in the case of Log4j, patch, patch to the next Java, and then the next day, the next Java, <laughs> and then the next day, the next Java, yeah. right? Um, and so that could be as simple as validating a code scan, um, and it's that we call that static code analysis, or if you ever hear anything like SAS, because there's programs that we've abstracted away, thank God. And, 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 and you can get down into the weeds of it, and you should at a certain degree, but that will be on the product side where we say, this is the space in the code. This is what we need to look at. And we can run that through an automation and say, is it there? Um, it gets even trickier, which is why I like being on the red side of things, um, when you need to dynamically test something to find um, the, if the vulnerability is still actually a thing in this product, what does that mean? Okay. As opposed to looking at the words in a dictionary, you need to look at how it's used in a sentence. Yeah. Um, and that would be the key. That would be a good way to understand the difference between SAST and DAS with a uh, static code, um, static application security testing and dynamic application security testing. So that's what kind of pushed me into that, into that realm where it's like, well, this is kind of boring. Like just looking at the static code analysis and checking a box because they would have would have when they do the next build, are they going to revert mm-hmm. to, to the feature change? So like, how do we? And so it just made my like I got really excited at that point because I'm like, I'm not the police, but like I'm the police. Like, what are you doing? Like, prove it. I'm a very much like a prove it person. And again, that's that intelligence, that military in me. It's like, well, how do you know that? And so I had that natural propensity. And so once we decide, OK, you are impacted. Have you patched it? How do we attest to the change? Is it a static check? Is it a dynamic check? Is it both? Okay, when Mm -hmm. we talk about security assessments, your security assessment is going to bring in that and a lot of other things. You're going to have some GRC people, if you guys heard of governance, risk, and compliance. They're going to say, well, hmm, this is publicly knowledgeable. So uh, based upon our relationship with these governments and and our ability to do good business and trusted business, we got to have this taken care of within this amount of time because Mm -hmm. this is the risk associated with this and risk has to do with monetary um, calculations of having something offline, but also the likelihood of this being taken advantage of and what it would mean if it was. So you have that calculation in there, you have uh, corporate communications in there. And then you have the whole, the whole back end of the changes still going on. So once it's determined that those things are all met, it's all tidy. We're unaffected. We're cleaned up. um, I am also reporting that to Um, senior management who is that that's the CTO that's the CISO right they have the there it is incapable for them to get as granular with that information they cannot review personally at the CISO level 7,000 plus applications to determine it you got to learn how to make a pivot chart so when people talk about soft skills and things of that nature come on Excel is not dead okay people just I used it a lot when I was doing my um, data analytics role and you as you should because it's still good and and, and there's a lot there that you can learn and they've even implemented um, a a lot of emerging technologies to make it easier to use Mm -hmm. but there are also other data analytics tools that you can use Um, but in in the in the heat of the night there's nothing like Excel and a pivot chart to say externally hosted, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. internally hosted, pivot that thing out. Okay. So once those pivot charts are made, we're briefing and we're continuing every day, something like at like, three times a day. Yeah. And that's depending just on, on the scope of the incident. That's just our time zone. Mind you, this is happening across the globe. This is an international global enterprise. We have products, services, customers all over the world. So we're checking back in. We're saying, did you patch? Did you patch? You know, even determining how those product teams, I wrote a communications plan for our incidents response team. How do I expect 
us to communicate to you and you to communicate to yeah. us about this because that becomes almost developer advocacy. And that's where you're getting into communication. Absolutely. To where these people are saying, hey, our team, this is our incident. We're running it. And we know you guys are on contact us this type of way. Yes. It's super important so that you don't, I mean, noise, you know, techno stress and noise is a real thing. How do you, how do you get the, and that's, it comes to experience. And at the same time, people can become entrenched and, and, and take things for granted. So I think you do have to have that consistent vigilance too, because we want to not over alert you, but we mm -hmm. want to be able to tell you when it's something that you should know within a timely manner. And when it comes to things like after when, like Wednesday is basically Friday to me, because if I know something is a high, has a high severity, I got to let you know immediately, even on the red side, like that's good communication to your point. But it's also about relationship building because it's like, if this might put them in a position where they're going to have to have somebody do overtime or someone might have to be there on a the weekend or after hours just to get that done. So it doesn't have to go to exception. Exception has to do with the risk tolerance of the company or the, of the product. Um, meaning we agreed that you would have this fixed by this. There's no risk, but if it's going to go beyond that, you then have to appeal to another body of uh, in your corporation. And this is a huge deal for products because every minute that you're not reaching your customer with your product is taking money. a hit and you're losing money.